Hamlin here from Blues Guitar Unleashed. Welcome and thanks for joining me today. Uh, in today's video, we're going to talk about how to play the blues with more feeling. Now, obviously, I can't make you feel more or less, and that's not really what we're talking about. Nor uh, am I going to tell you, you know, ride more freight trains and have more pain and suffering in your life. Uh, again, that's sort of, you know, no one can teach that. But, but even if you had 50 years, right? If you've, if you've had all kinds of experience to draw from and if you've lived a hard life, it doesn't really matter because it wouldn't help you get that feeling out through your guitar any better, right? You have to have both. And I think most of you, you know, watching this video probably have plenty that you want to say and hopefully you just need some help making it sing. And that's where we're heading, right? So there are three things that will greatly impact the feel of what you play. And not a one of these things will require you to learn anything new. Okay, so we're not going to have to learn any new chords or any new scales. That's kind of a big deal. I don't want you to have to run off and, and feel like you have to learn a bunch of new stuff. Now, I am assuming that you can already play a minor pentatonic or blues scale. And in fact, I'm really not even going to talk about using any sounds outside of that scale. Sure, playing the major blue sound or playing a mode or an arpeggio or anything like that is going to change the feel. But in my experience, those things don't have nearly the impact that the three things we're going to talk about will have. Okay, and those three things are timing, how your notes fall within the groove. Okay, number two is the attack, how you approach and how you strike each and every note. And number three is your phrasing, how long or how short your phrases are and how you space them apart. Now notice that I didn't mention speed, all right? I think that speed in and of itself has very little to do with feel, all right? If I feel frantic, I might play something very fast and that would certainly do a very good job of getting that feeling across. But as you'll see, you know, with most things like that, there's a trade-off. If I play something very fast, it, it's gonna have a tendency to kind of, you know, homogenize my timing and my attack. You know, I'm sort of going to play everything the same. And so that's really what you notice, you know, when someone plays fast. You notice that it sort of goes by in a blur and that all of the notes are approached the same way and the timing is sort of all the same, right? So in the end, it's it still boils down to, to those things that I mentioned. You know, the phrasing is gone if you play something fast. You know, it's, it's sort of a big blur. The attack on each string and each note kind of has to be the same because of the speed. And the timing also has to kind of all be the same because of the speed, right? So it still boils down to those three things, right? So I, I don't want to, you know, speed comes up all the time when we talk about blues. And, you know, one person will say, well, you can't play the blues if you play fast. And, and I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't necessarily disagree with it either. I don't think it, it really is an issue one way or the other. I don't think it should even come up. All right, so let's let's talk about these three things. The first one, like I said, is the timing. So when I talk about timing, right, I mean how your notes fall against the beat. And I'm gonna show you this, but there are three possibilities. You can be slightly ahead of the beat, believe it or not. You can be right on top of the beat, like literally right at the same time, or you can be slightly behind the beat. And all of them will still be in time, as we say. It's not, none of them are gonna sound out of time, but you'll hear they do give a different feel, right? Now in the blues, being slightly behind the beat is, is customary, it, but that doesn't mean it's the only option, right? So let me, let me demonstrate. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna play, you know, good old A minor, uh, good old A minor blues box. Blues box one. Nothing fancy, and I'm going to play it in swing eighth notes against a metronome. Now, first, what I'll do is I will play it just ahead of the beat. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play it through, and I'm going to sort of be a little bit more anxious about it. You'll hear that I'm just in front of the beat all the time. Check it out. A one, two, three, four. All right, so 
hopefully you, you, you can hear, it, this is going to be a subtle thing, and what you may find is that you have to listen to me play it ahead of the beat, and then you'll have to listen to me play it right on the top of the beat like I'm about to, and then slightly behind the beat. Sometimes you can't really hear it unless you listen to the three of them together. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me play it right on top of the beat now. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to aim to really get my notes right exactly where the beat hits. Not before, not behind. Check it out. A uh, one, two, three, four. <laughs> And then finally, I'm going to play just a little bit behind the beat. And this should be a little more characteristic of what you're used to hearing. Check it out. A one, two, three, four. So as I hope you can hear, none of those, none of those three options sound out of time, right? That, that would be a different problem entirely. If you, if you can't keep time, it's a different issue. But being able to consciously choose whether you'll play, uh, you know, just a little bit in front of the beat for a more urgent sound or lay back far behind the beat for a more relaxed sound will make a huge difference in how anything that you play is perceived by your audience, okay? So let me, let me demonstrate this one more time. And what I'm going to do is without stopping, uh, or I'll just stop to tell you between, I'm gonna go from playing ahead of the beat to right on top of the beat to slightly behind it. So you can hear all three together and, and hopefully your ear will start to pick up on the difference. Let's, let's do it, check this out. All right, so the first one I'm gonna play uh, ahead of the beat. Here we go. A one, a two, a three, a four. <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to try and get right on top of it. A uh, one, two, three, four. All right, now I'll be just a little bit laid back. Here we go. A uh, one, two, three, four. So again, notice that I'm, I'm just playing the exact same thing. It's nothing but a scale. But you can take any lick, any phrase, any pattern that you know, and you can approach it this way, and you're going to get a different feel. And that's what it's all about, right? We want a different emotion that we're trying to get across uh, in how we approach the beat, okay? So uh, that's some options for that. Let's now talk about how you attack your notes. And this is by far, I think, the biggest um, you know, option. There's, there's, there's more things that you can do here than just anything. So again, I'm going to play good old box one, you know, uh, of the blue scale, right? So here's just, you know, normal blue scale box one. Okay. So I've got, just plucking all the notes. All right. So one of the first things I could do is I could palm mute, right? So I could, kind of get my palm of my hand there, right? So this is a good one. And obviously that's, you know, same kind of thing, but that has a very different uh, effect. Okay, I can slide into a note. So basically what I'm doing is I can just take any note, you know. So any note in my scale, I can slide into it. And I'm just going from, you know, a couple of frets away. Or maybe one fret away. 
obviously, yeah, it sounds a little silly if I do it all over the place, but it's a great effect. Similarly, I can bend into a note. For example, um, instead of playing the uh, the eighth fret on the second string, I can grab the seventh string, uh, seventh fret, a half step below it, bend into it. So I just go, the note that I want, go down a half step, bend into it. <laughs> and even though the, the half step below it isn't in key, that's not where I'm hanging out. And again, it might sound a little silly if you do it all the time, but it works pretty cool. You can also um, slide down. So again, instead of sliding up into a note, I could slide down. And if I slide from really far, it might be a little tough to hit, but that's certainly gonna give a different feel from just playing those notes one at a time, okay? Uh, on lower notes, I could do a pre-bend and release into the note. Um, so it's the same idea as bending up to a note, but I'm coming from above. Okay, so another thing that I could do is I could do a rake. Now, rakes are a little bit tricky for a lot of people because they involve an enormous amount of muting, both with the left hand and with the right, assuming you're playing left-handed. Uh, or uh, playing right-handed. If you were playing left-handed, your picking hand would be your left hand, and this would all be a little backwards. You'd have to turn your lefts and rights around. But nothing really changes. The idea of a rake is that everything is muted except the note I want. So when I play that top note, my other three fingers on my left hand are muting that out. If I do something like a bend, my right hand mutes everything out until I get the note I want. Or sometimes I don't. <laughs> and I could like combine a rake with a bend into a note. And I'm not even talking about like vibrato, you know? Once you're on a note, there's different things that you can do, you know, to sort of add some sugar to a note. I, I call it adding a little sugar to a note. I'm just talking about attacking the note. So I'm not even really talking about doing a fall off or doing some vibrato or any of those kinds of things. That's, that would be a whole, uh, a whole other video. Now, in addition to raking down, I could come up. Very Stevie Ray Vaughan kind of thing. And while it's not necessarily a, a, a different sound than, I'll say the, you know, what would that be, an up, uh, a down rake and an up rake maybe? <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, they're, they're just different. It's a little bit of a different vibe, okay? It's not always exactly the same. Uh, and, and again, raking is a great way to take a single note you know, maybe you're just zinging a top note. And I can get a nice... I can get a nice note there, just a single note. But with the rake, it sounds a lot better than just... You know, that's kind of dull. So that makes a big difference. Uh, now, of course, you can do slurs, right? We can do a hammer on to a note. We can do a pull off. So hammer-ons and pull-offs are, are commonly called slurs. And obviously if I if I do a bunch of hammer-ons, that's gonna sound very different than a bunch of palm mutes. I'm gonna give a very different feel. 
right? And of course, you know, I can, I'm not even, I haven't even talked about like digging in hard. Obviously I can, I can really pick hard or not so hard. That's gonna, that's gonna make a big difference. Uh, another thing I could do is like tremolo picking. And a lot of people think of tremolo picking as going super fast. It doesn't necessarily have to be. It could just be, you know, as fast as you can do it. Right, so if I'm playing a note, and I hit it a bunch of times, that's gonna have a really different impact than just, you know? You know, and that's all one note, but I can I can really get a mood. I can really set a tone, <laughs> pardon the pun. I can really set a tone with that, all right? Um, another way, uh, just I just got a couple more for you. Another way that, that, that is a great thing is, you know, obviously picking versus, versus a finger. You know, the Albert King, I call it the Albert King finger snap. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm taking my middle finger on my picking hand and I'm literally picking the string and slapping it against the fretboard. And think about how different that sounds to this. Right, so there's a lot I can get there. And of course, um, you know, like with a little more overdrive, I can do things like artificial harmonics. That's a little bit trickier, and to be perfectly honest, I have an entire video, uh, I think, on how to do artificial harmonics. But it is another way to attack a note. So there's, that's like 11 different ways to, to attack a note, and there are many more. But of course, you know, if we start talking about like two-handed stuff, you know, there's a lot of other things that sort of start to get outside the blues genre. So I'm gonna try and, you know, kind of, color within the lines for this one, right? Now, the third thing that we talked about or that I mentioned earlier is phrasing. So, so far we have, you know, how we approach the beat. Are we ahead of the beat? Are we behind the beat? Are we right on top of the beat? We have, I think, 11 different ways now to approach a note, all right? That's, there's a lot there. But when you add in a little bit of phrasing, right, this is gonna have an enormous impact on how your solos feel and how you communicate that feel to your audience. And that, that's what this is all about, right? You, when you're soloing, you're having a conversation, you're telling your story, right? When I play in my band, you know, sometimes we, we, we play for a while, like, you know, the keyboard player plays and he's like, yeah, I'm done. I've said what I need to say. All right, sometimes, you know, sometimes it's two choruses, sometimes it's six, you know, it's just, you, you say your piece and then that's it, right? So whatever whatever you're saying, you know, sometimes I can get it all out there in two courses and sometimes I got a longer story to tell today. So sometimes it takes longer, right? And and phrasing is a big part of, of that communication, of that telling your story, right? So there's not a hard and fast rule on phrasing. And I'm just gonna give you a little couple of, of suggestions, but the main thing is that you be aware of it, right? And, and the other thing is that phrasing, is gonna rely and combine heavily with the timing and with your note attack from earlier, right? So in other words, it's rare that you're gonna only change your phrasing. While you're at it, you're probably gonna change your, your attack and you're probably gonna change your timing a little bit to drive a point home. So let's say, for example, that I'm playing over slow blues and let's say it's kind of quiet, right? And I'm wanting to kind of let it breathe and, and I wanna to start to build the anticipation. Okay, so I'm gonna phrase it a little bit more sparse like this.
All right, so, so notice that there's a lot of space between the licks, an uncomfortable amount of space. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's, there's, this is one of the things that I have the hardest time getting people to do is to leave space. Let, you can let two bars go by. The band will go on without you. <laughs> okay, leave that space, right? So notice that each phrase was very short, easy for the, for the listener to digest, right? You might also notice that I'm pretty far behind the beat. I'm tending to relax and I'm using a, a, a pretty soft attack. Sometimes I, I would pluck them, you know, to, to make a point, right? But I'm, I'm varying things, right? Now, on the other hand, if things are getting towards the middle or the end of the solo and I'm trying to build the energy, I'm going to keep the notes going, right? I want to, I want to keep it flowing and I, and I want to not let up. Now notice that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to play fast. I can do this with just a couple of notes maybe even one note, right? Check this out. So obviously that's got a lot more going on. I'm, you know, I'm doing some tremolo picking and I'm plucking and I'm, you know, just playing constantly. And that's going to obviously build your excitement. And of course I could continue to build by change, you know, with my note choice. And there's a lot of other things that can go on, but I'm, you know, in, in the matter of phrasing. And of course we added the, the attack, you know, that changed the timing. I was a little bit more frantic, a little bit more ahead of the beat. All of these things come into play. Now, of course, you know, the examples that I'm showing you in this video, this, this is just meant to be food for thought. And I obviously I didn't teach you, you know, any specific licks because the point here is that I want you to apply these things to your own licks. <laughs> and the idea is that you already play, right? So if you play a certain lick and you want it to sound more relaxed, right? Just park it a little, for, a little further back behind the beat and maybe leave, or, or maybe uh, leave a little bit more space around it instead of, you know, playing a bunch of stuff and then playing your lick and then playing a bunch of stuff give some space and then play your lick and then give some space, take some time off, right? Or if you take the same lick and you want it to sound more exciting and fiery, you know, play it two or three or four times in a row and push the beat a little bit, right? Um, let me show you, if, if I just take a very simple, right, something kind of simple like that, right? If I, if I were to, uh, if I were to play that, over a, a slow blues, just, just a nice simple little thing. Uh, and I want to keep it mellow, it might sound like this. Right, so nice and simple. I, I didn't play anything before it, I left some space after it. I just kind of played it, threw it out there, nothing too fancy. I could take that exact same idea though <laughs> and play it a few times in a row and get aggressive with the beat and watch the difference. Check this out. Right, so that's effectively the same lick. You know, I just played it like four times in a row and then kind of kept playing after it. Again, I'm not really adding anything new. I'm just using the same thing in a new and a different way, right? And I hope that in this video, maybe I've given you some ideas that you can use in your own playing. So thanks for hanging out with me today and I look forward to talking to you soon.